like to welcome you on behalf of the sister projects, the Hummingbird, Fume, and the Quantme. So I think we have a lot of colleagues from Fume and the Hummingbird, and we have several online from the Quantme project. So um, I would like to give a very brief introduction to the day first. So today is devoted to the academic discussions. So I'd like to raise your attention that we are not aiming a very conventional way. Let's present and get some questions. It's more like really discussing about what we have found and what might be the implications either in academic, from the academic perspective or the policy wise. So the second day is the policy day and we are not gonna be here. We will be in the parliament for the ones who already registered. So we will have the opportunity to discuss what we have raised today and also maybe what is left with some policymakers and politicians. So it is not only about presenting them what we have done, it is also a way to raise our question to them how they are going to ensure what to do with our research and with our results. So um, let me uh, start very briefly about, yeah, about the hummingbird. So in fact, we, I assume that many of you are migrant researchers are interested in migration. So we hear a lot and it's not only about the academic agenda. We hear about migration from different perspectives and different hope or set levels. We do know that mass migration is there. We are talking about climate induced. We need talents. And then we really would like to talk about the talent migration. If you can go by that. And yeah, there are some cases where we say, oh, we should have more migrants, please. But then we are also encountered with a lot of preventive approaches saying that against migration. So in fact, uh, can you move to the next one? So in fact, what we are talking about is how migration has been reflected and how it is perceived. This picture is from 2018 and it is talking about I don't know if you can see quite. So what we are in fact talking about is that it is not only how it is reflected on media, it is only about how it is perceived, what people think about it. And we do know that several policy approaches are depending on the public opinion as well. So what we know, what we say, what we show about migration does a do matter. And we do see that several studies show that people have people are very confused about what to think about migration. If it is a good thing, it's a bad thing. Is it a threat? Is it an opportunity? But the studies usually show that. Did you go? Yes, perfect. Thank you. So um, the the first one that you see on the left hand side is from 2018, and it is the perception of uncontrolled migration as a threat. So as you see that all the red countries are considering the people think that uncontrolled migration is a top threat for the country. And when you look on the right hand side, these are the how, what threat areas are more interesting or getting more attention for people are that, you know, Islamic radicals, migration, climate crisis, nationalism, climate change and Russia. And this is from 2019, okay? So before the Ukraine war. So we do see that my, more than 20% of population <laughs> thinks that migration is the biggest threat to Europe. So on one hand, we do say that we need migrants, we need migration, we have to govern it better. On the other hand, we create an image of migration as a threat, as something bad to the community. So what we hope to do today is through different projects, we'd like to talk about, is it really the case? What do we really know about what's gonna happen with migration? And with the specific call, three projects were funded to study migration scenarios and migration patterns from different perspectives. To start with the Hummingbird project, of course, we wanted to start with understanding the uncertainties and rephrase several assumptions about migrations and migrants, but we are working on projections. We are working on how to widen EU's viewpoint on policy and migration nexus. But we also bring in a very strong qualitative scenario building on the stories of migrants and rue. So we are not only aiming to reach out to people who have already reached Europe, but we are also talking to people who are still on their way to Europe. And we are trying to validate, you'll see, you'll hear more about big data, different big data types and technologies, how to improve the uh, um, estimations 
for stocks and flows and more like from an, like an assessment. And of course, at the end, we need to find a way where we merge the knowledge to have the bigger picture. In short, Hummingbird aims to talk about hops of migration, but people really make their way. So these are the transit points. I think Daniel will talk more about that because our goal is to improve the theoretical frameworks because we are talking about the same push and pull factors and the driver's approach for long, but we also know that we are not always, uh, we don't always have the sufficient information to know uh, better, which is also correct for the data. We talked a lot about what's going on wrong with data and we're going to use, we are using satellite data, social media data and mobile phone data, as well as the alternative data sources. So the goal is, can we have novel scenarios for creating a better migration response? We are going through a mixed methods approach. Quantitatively, we're working with conventional data sources and big data, as well as the qualitative approaches. And our consortium holds 16 partners. We are proud to say that we have several NGOs and SMEs and then Eric on board from um, 10 different countries. And I'll give the floor to Carson to talk a bit more about the film now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tuba. Um, also, thank you and your team very much for having us here at, at VUP. <laughs> Wouldn't have been possible without you and your team's help to make this happen. Um, in fact, um, I have to say the, the um, uh, POs at the Commission did a really good job of connecting the three projects from the very beginning. So we've been in close exchange from the very start. So I'm very happy that we have this common um, conference here now. Um, as Tuba said, my name is Carsten Kessler. I've been coordinating the Future Migration Scenarios for Europe project, or FUME as we call it for short. Um, as you can guess, from the name, it's about migration scenarios. Um, but what's special about it? So the special thing about uh, FUME is that we've been looking at um, uh, local factors of migration. So uh, local uh, push factors, you could say, because people do not just move from one country to the other, right? They live in a place before they leave, in a village, in a city. There are certain circumstances there that drive the desire to migrate. Uh, so we've tried to better understand that. And then also uh, in the destination countries, um, look at the cities because that's where most migrants end up in larger cities. What are the things that attract them to a city, to even a neighborhood within a city to settle there? Um, so it's really this local focus that makes the um, project um, special, you could say. And in this local context, we've then looked at uh, socio-demographic, um, economic, and also environmental factors that um, drive the migration. Um, so you can't really do local without having local case studies, of course. So we had uh, four um, countries of origin where we did um, interviews and surveys in different places. Um, well, Ukraine was added to the list, um, of course, before um, the Russian war on Ukraine when we wrote the proposal. Uh, back then, the idea was to include a country that um, is just on the border of the EU. And of course, the whole story has completely changed now, as you all know. So we also had to adjust our scenarios uh, to the new situation. And then uh, on the destination side, we've picked four major European cities that all have a different um, history of migration, different migrant communities, and so on. Um, without going into too much detail, the basic idea is that we created global um, migration and population scenarios um, that are then broken down to the regional level and um, in the end to the local level. Um, and to each of these uh, scenarios, they were quantified. And then um, uh, in the end, we created uh, for the four um, cities, we created maps that show uh, where migrants might live in the future under different scenarios. And just to give you um, a quick uh, glimpse of some of the results. So on the left here, we have uh, immigration and emigration uh, numbers uh, for different scenarios for EU countries. Um, so the different colors are the different scenarios, and you can see how they diverge going further into the future. We've looked up to 2050, by the way, so it's quite, quite long term um, uh, com compared to some of the work that uh, Tuba and her team are doing. Um, and uh, then at the very end, at the local level, this is one of the results, an, an example from Amsterdam, uh, Turkish and Moroccan uh, migrants uh, in a specific uh, scenario projected for the year 2050 
and their distribution across Amsterdam. So just to give you a very quick idea of, of what the results look like that have come out of the project. Um, of course, you will see more of this uh, today and, and tomorrow. I'm very much looking forward to have uh, um, many of my colleagues from the consortium present uh, some of their results. Um, and I'm looking forward to discuss with you. Thank you very much. Um, and I think now it's uh, Jakob's turn, who is online. Yes. Jakob? Wait a second, we might not hear you yet. Thank you. Can you can you enable my camera, perhaps? Because I, I we'll give it a try, but uh, I cannot promise at the moment. Probably. Okay. Let's. Well. So, without further ado, very warm welcome. Very warm welcome to everyone from Quantumic, the third project in this uh, lot. So we are a smaller group. We are a consortium of seven institutions with the University of Southampton uh, being the hub, and we have one external partner in Canada as well. So there's a subset of us uh, at a kickoff meeting three, uh, three and a half years ago in the, in the photo. Uh, what we aim to do, what, what makes us distinct is uh, we, we have a very strong quantitative focus as per the name and acronym, but also we do incorporate in our work quite a lot of the conceptual and theoretical insights feeding into the quantitative uh, scenarios that we aim to produce. And the key themes of our projects are the complexity and the uncertainty of migration. And this is, as the day evolves today, you will see that this will be coming back in quite a few uh, aspects that we, of, of our work that we'll be sharing with you. Why quantitative? I mean, there's, there's a high policy demand for that, both for the short and, and long-term uh, operational and strategic reasons. And it's very high on the agenda now, especially with the uh, Ukraine crisis not, uh, is, is an obvious example, but, but uh, generally this is within the broader framework of the thinking around the preparedness and crisis blueprint and similar initiatives. So in this conference, what we will do, we'll present some of the elements of the process of creating scenarios, starting from the concepts and drivers, going through the estimates, uh, and then finishing with a construction analy analysis of scenarios. So our work is nearly done, as, as is uh, those of the other projects. We've got so far 38 deliverables publicly available on the project website. We've we've been quite uh, also quite active in terms of dissemination, but the current the current focus is really on wrapping things up and uh, making sure that they reach as broad audience as possible. So all the more thanks to to the organizers for uh, for having us on board for this for this conference. I'm sorry not to be able to to be in person in Brussels, but uh, uh, I, I think the whole the whole team is delighted to be able to present and share our insights with you today online. So thank you very much and enjoy the conference. Thank you very much. So we move on and uh, we would like to invite to the roundtable discussion uh, three scholars. Uh, so first, uh, welcome Anne Singleton from University of Bristol. And together we'll hear also uh, reflections from Jean-Michel uh, Lafleur, yes, and uh, Rainer Mintz. So what, if you feel comfortable, you can also sit here. Otherwise, you can also join here. So for, uh, welcome, uh, Anne, first. And uh, I will share one of your uh, screen. If you would like to join, welcome. Okay, thanks. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll just present some provocative uh, concepts and notions and ideas. I think um, I know that the other presenters are going to, to go into some depth um, about some of the questions that we need to address. 
I was asked to talk about knowledge gaps and I think we should also acknowledge that it's not just a, a problem of looking at knowledge gaps when we're thinking about scenarios and forecasting. We need to think about why are we in this position? Uh, thank you. Uh, at this stage. So I'm going to say a few words about work that I did uh, in 1995 on scenarios and forecasting and why I think these three projects are so important and how, it, how it's taken so long to get to a stage where so much work has been possible um, and <clears throat> the knowledge gaps that exist in, in um, data and informing forecasting very much still exist as they did in 1995. Um, so I think we as we need humility, as I've seen across all of these projects, some humility uh, and no hubris around finding the answers, uh, but working with what is possible. So my concerns really are about our role as academics in the production and reproduction of knowledge about migration and whether or not we're following an agenda or responding to an agenda that is set uh, and framed in a way that um, actually is not uh, for social science reasons, not um, being determined for the purposes of academic research. And what can we do and what is our role in helping to reframe and reshape that agenda? And it starts with the definition of the problem. So the very subject that we're looking at, um, migration, is conceived of and, and um, presented as a problem now increasingly in policy terms and the title of this conference is focusing on the future of migration to Europe not migration of human beings within around in and out of Europe in the world or mobilities uh, not as a problem so it is framed as a political problem and a policy problem and the work that we do uh, on push pull reasons for migration, drivers, I see as very much accepting this overall agenda and the determinism, really uh, very often economic determinism, um, which informs uh, thinking around people's reasons for moving and migrating. So I'll just say a few words really about this, um, this chart behind us. <clears throat> it was never published in its own right. It became part of a big discussion in Eurostat about the role of collecting migration data uh, and what was the purpose of doing this kind of research. The, the title of the paper uh, of this model that I, basically I did most of the work on, but it's based on a, a model from Fielding 1993. But we looked at the restructuring, so I can turn around. To, we, we, this model uh, is for the analysis of international migration flows and for Im improving the migration assumptions in demographic projections. And we, we structured it so the, the first column looks at processes, processes, and then the next one is the concepts needed to understand those processes, and then the typology of flows and of migrants, and then methods for improving the assumptions. And this is quite an ambitious model that we thought, in order to understand how to improve forecasting, you would need to take this sort of approach that could take into account um, all the so I'm going to put you on this. Yeah, so, excuse me. <clears throat> yeah, so we wanted to understand um, wh what produces migration and mobility and what policy con which policy concerns um, are to be taken into account when academics look at this kind of research. So in the first column, we looked at global restructuring, how it affected what was then known as sending and receiving states. We looked at economic restructuring, social restructuring, spatial restructuring, and political and legal restructuring, kind of anticipating what was going to happen at, at global levels, with global cities, with political space. We, we looked at environmental changes and climate change as well, that did not use those terms, but environmental changes. And then from those structural changes, we looked at the kind of main concepts that would be needed to, in order to carry out um, this kind of research on improving assumptions. And many of these have, have taken place across these three projects. We looked at why there should be a focus on the migrant rather than on the policies. Why, um, how do you count individuals moving in time and space? Um, and what since then has been known as 
really methodological nationalism, seeing the state as the nation state as a container of all social science research. What are the implications of that for understanding international migration? And was there a way in which to conceptualize uh, mobility that would overcome uh, these national, um, the kind of the box uh, of the nation state uh, as being the product producer and reproducer of um, knowledge on migration. When we're talking about the European Union, what we have is a set of nation states combining in the EU very much in a, a larger box and frame, but the source of the data is still at national level. So in the third column, um, I, I, we, John and I, John Salt and, and, and I developed a typology of my flows of different types of migrants and migration. We looked broadly at um, registered and unregistered migrants as, as we uh, defined them in those days. Primary and secondary migration flows, uh, ethnicity. Um, and then in the third, uh, sorry, the fourth column, the methods of improving migration assumptions. And so we look particularly at improving statistical models for the analysis and forecasting of international migration. And an awful lot of work has gone into improving data quality and data coverage uh, uh, since, since this period. Um, and at some levels, there's a much better understanding of the gaps in data availability and data quality. I think there's still a, a lack of understanding for the, of the need for a critical perspective on who is setting the priorities for research, who is setting the priorities for um, the, the policy definitions that are used in in migration research and these are all involved um, these are all embedded in any kind of attempt to produce um, forecasting scenarios um, that is based on data so the, we've we're faced with a contradiction that embedded in the forecasts and the scenarios are the very limitations of the data and the data are limited by the policy narratives and the negative framing about mobility being something that needs to be controlled and, and only the only concern should be about immigration. So my plea really is to think, go back and think again about the concepts, the categories, the definitions. And as Lucy, Lucy Mablin would say, uh, who's in Sheffield, she would say, think about the concept and the category of a human being rather than dichotomies of citizen and migrant. Um, think about the human being and mobility being part of being human. Um, so I just perhaps a little provocatively say, what is the point of all these forecasting scenarios and who is it for? And then who are we? You know, when, when we're looking at something, who are the we looking at what's happening? So it's just a plea for that kind of critical thinking throughout the next two days. And thanks to everyone for basically carrying out the work that I had hoped to do with John Salt, but very naively in 1995 thought was possible to achieve in a short space of time. And it takes decades to get anywhere near um, the, and the kind of humility that, that, you, that everybody in these networks has um, that I didn't have in those days. So I'm still learning, I'm learning how to learn better. So thank you. <coughs> Correctly placed. Yeah. Okay. Good uh, morning, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. I'm trying not to, to look too silly with this. I think that's okay. 
try to not to not distract you with my uh, with my microphone. Um, thank you very much uh, for the invitation today. So discussing a little bit the uh, questions for today with with Tuba, we felt that could be uh, interesting to focus a little bit on the, on the question of relations between migration and welfare state and what's there to reflect upon. What are what do we know and what we do most interestingly probably don't know yet about those issues so to do this i um i don't want to just come here and sell my soup and tell the work i've done but i'll just mention and give a, a link at the end that we've just completed in liege an erc project uh, on, called mitsopro so it looked at trend, the transnationalization of social protection practices so basically looking at how migrants uh build their access to to welfare uh, across the across borders um what i would like to do however today is really to discuss with you more a little bit what we have hum humbly learned in the process of of doing this uh, this project on what really is uh, some of the blind spots that we think remain and, and maybe how we can we can go about them so i think one of the the main uh, lessons that we quickly realized doing a lot of literature review on questions of migration and welfare is that there's really a process going on of siloization of research on migration and welfare and of, of course as migration scholars, for many of us in the room, we know that this is not exclusive to the issue of, uh, of welfare. And there's a lot of topics within migration that are clearly uh, worked uh, as niche with, a, uh, with very little inter interdisciplinary dialogue and very often also little um, uh, mixing of methods of little articulation between quantitative and qualitative methods. So, but what, coming back to migration and welfare, what we really felt is was, was really four bodies of, of literature that very often didn't really speak much to each other in spite of the obvious interest to do so. There's obviously the whole trend of research about how my, what welfare needs trigger migration decisions. And uh, obviously here, uh, economists have been very instrumental uh, for several decades in looking at, at these kind of research questions. Uh, but it's not only about the needs of migrants that have been looked at, but it's also been at the needs of welfare states to deal with the to deal with the shortages, for example, in their workforces in, in some, some part of their welfare systems. If you think, for example, of the mobility of health professionals, which has also been a, 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 an area that has been very much researched, also mostly from quantitative perspectives. Now, um, another strand of research that is mostly uh, looked at by uh, social policy scholars, for example, is the, the one that the old trend that looks at the impact of migration on welfare states. If you look at uh, conditions of access to benefits, uh, or, but also um, discussions around the, uh, the politici politicization of immigrant access to welfare, which has become a very hot topic, not only at political, at, at policy levels, uh, with the instrumentalization of that topic, but also among researchers looking, examining, for example, discourses around migration and welfare, public opinions around migration and welfare. Then you have a more socio-anthropological trend that has paid a lot of attention, sorry, at, um, at the organization of welfare at the family level, uh, not only, but mostly at the transnational level, looking at how migrants organize their, their protections across borders, the role of remittances, of course, in uh, facilitating or permitting access to, to, to welfare in, uh, in sending countries, and the whole trend of anthropological research on care chains, of course, uh, looking at how needs for um, needs for care in Europe, for instance, leads to mobility in different parts of the world, primarily uh, in Latin America, if you think about all the, or the mobility of caretakers, but also the mobility between uh, the Philippines and Europe or the Philippines and the United States. And then uh, uh, a last and then maybe less expected trend of research that also uh, a little bit separated from the rest, like the three others, is of course, the, the whole work on diaspora policies, which is a very niche topic emerging as well, which really looks at the question of welfare, mostly from the sending state perspective and looking at how states are increasingly concerned with continuing to respond to the needs of immigrants 
and their families, whether they are movers or non-movers, via a number of set of policies. And here in our projects, for instance, we found across an, a number of countries in, in a large policy survey we did in 40 countries that there is an increasing amount of policy innovations among states, whether they are Europeans or non-European states, trying to respond to welfare needs of their citizens residing abroad. So a sort of externalization of, of welfare systems. I'll come back to this in a minute. Now, what does this salarization entail in terms of blind spots in, in research? Of course, there's many things to be said, and this is only just a, a snapshot of a few ideas, but I perceive that at least at three levels, we have a few blind spots. I think first, at the conceptual level, we really need to uh, reconceptualize our, a, little bit, a little bit our view of how we engage with migration and welfare by taking more of a transnational approach, considering welfare states both as receivers of immigrants, but also as senders. And this is something we've learned, for instance, looking at, as I just mentioned, all these innovative policies. But also, if you look, for example, at the activism of many states in Europe and elsewhere to sign uh, social security agreements or to make such agreements part of readmission agreements or any kind of international agreements with uh, sending states, you can see, or transit states, you can see that this is really something that we need to pay more attention at the um, conceptual level. At the policy level, that is de facto con uh, con consequence of this, we really, I think, need to also look at, uh, pay more attention at the interconnections between policy reforms in the area of migrations and policy reforms uh, at the social policy level. We know uh, with the work, for example, of scholars such as Mesadra, that there is a process going on in some parts of the world by which uh, welfare policies are uh, increasingly being used for uh, migration control. Think of, for example, uh, the, the requirement not to be on, uh, on welfare, to be able to renew your residence permit in many different countries. Um, think about also about how, and this is the case of Belgium, how welfare uh, data can be sometimes used to terminate residence permit of, uh, of, of certain migrants. Now, at the individual level, there is also, uh, in, in my view, a need to pay more attention between formal and informal welfare practices. Um, again, and this is a little bit related to the fact that we are very segmented in terms of disciplines when we look at these issues. Uh, we tend to have a socio-anthropological approach to migration and welfare that really looks at the informality practices of solidarity across borders, practices of migrant associations that deal with welfare needs. And we tend to disconnect that from all the work that is being done on formal access to welfare states, on the work on policies, which are intrinsically related because one obviously feed the other. So what are the ways forward? And I think one, uh, if I can suggest three, is one would be to try to reconceptualize and update our theories on the link between migration and welfare. As much as this theory of the welfare magnet has been criticized to just name one, we're still very much, very much influenced by these approaches, especially at the policy level or in the public opinion. So we need, I think, to come with better concepts and theories to, to counterbalance uh, such uh, dominating views which have, and I'm not completely discarding it, but it is only one part of the story that does not apply broadly across all cases of mobility. Second way forward, I think we need also to think about innovating with methods. And uh, I think uh, listening to the three presentations today, I think this is like, the perfect place to, to do that. I'm, I'm quite impressed actually, and also talking to some of you earlier about already what's been done, whether we're talking about uh, exploiting existing data and, and, and working on the interoperability, uh, such as in the project uh, of, of Casper. Uh, the use of, uh, of big data also, of course, and I know Tuba has been very active in this with her recent book. So I think here there's a lot to be done, but also there's a lot in, uh, to be still to be done about trying to articulate this also with more qualitative approaches and working on how on mixed method approaches to see how one can help the other. And I think also in terms of innovations of methods, there is among political scientists uh, who are often latecomers, uh, big interest nowadays for the experimental methods. And I think 
uh, issues of migration and welfare is probably a good topic for that. But of course, and that's why I, I wrote it here, we do have with such questions uh, such as migration and welfare, maybe an additional responsibility to think about the ethical concern of our research. This is true for every migration concern, uh, every migration research. But when we look at migration and welfare, given the uh, political sensitivity of the topic, we do have uh, an additional concern, I think, to really place ethical concern about uh, really think before conducting our research about the political, the possible instrumentalization of our data. Uh, and the last element, of course, to make this possible is to really commit seriously to interdisciplinarity. As I show, I think we do have this problem of siloization and it's, it's great that uh, in events like this one today, I can come and I'm coming more from a qualitative uh, perspective and I'm very much looking forward to, to hear more about the projects and, uh, and see how this can facilitate engagement between disciplines. So thanks for your attention and looking forward to the discussion. I put just the link yeah, for the the project. Uh, we will share the slides uh, with the participants as well after the conference. And now welcome Rainer Muns. Um, so uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm so I'm 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 a quant make uh, part of, uh, of of the game here, but I'm also sitting at the board of uh, Hummingbird. So. I will give you a more quantitative approach uh, to uh, what I think. So what we what we know about is the stock of migrants defined as people living in one country born in another country. So here we have good data, not everywhere in the world, but at least we have a fairly good idea. The United Nations is publishing data, Eurostat is publishing data, many national uh, statistics contain that data. They come from censuses, they come from population registers, they come from survey, micro surveys like the European Labor Force Survey. <coughs> and so we have that that's based on stock data, very important. So we are talking about Europe. And here the data situation is quite uh, elaborate. We do not only have uh, statistical data, we also have as we have just heard from the projects here, also data that are, um, how you say, more granular um, uh, surveys, uh, interviews with people, um, uh, geographic distribution data from geographers, etc. So, well done. I give you two parts of the world where there's also a lot of migration and where this uh, situation is not the case. Um, the one is the Gulf states. The Gulf states have a huge amount of immigration, um, large stocks of, of migrants. Uh, in, in many Gulf states, migrants are 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80% of the population. If you think about Qatar, for example, uh, or Kuwait, 50%, uh, something like that. There is very little attention, interestingly. There's no research. There is no Qatari migration researchers I have ever come across, despite the fact that there's a lot going on. And European and American researchers have almost no interest um, in, in, in doing research there. It only pops up when people are dying uh, while building a stadium and when you have body bags returning or when you have uh, NGOs uh, advocating <clears throat> for the rights of these people. But usually NGOs also, I mean, have other concerns than looking at uh, what's going on there. Interestingly, the governments of sending countries like India, Pakistan, the Philippines, etc., also don't pay a lot of attention what's happening uh, to their expats. And then we have, uh, I give you a third example, there is free movement of labor within the ECOWAS region, a lot of people going back and forth. This is why you don't see it in the stock data, but there's a lot of migration going on in Western Africa. Again, no local researchers and not very many people, I mean, paying attention despite the fact that there's a lot of say migration traffic there. I just wanted to contrast that, what we know, what we don't know. So we know a lot about the um, the stock of migrants living in Europe. We know where they come from. Eurostat is providing that kind of data. So that's, uh, I mean, um, something that is familiar to you. 
um, in relative terms, Luxembourg has the la largest uh, stock of migrants, but when you so, uh, compare it uh, to other countries, you see that has also to do with the tininess of Luxembourg. It's mainly EU citizens living in other parts of, um, of uh, uh, nearby, uh, crossing the border, etc. Again, that's stock data. So we know a little less about the flow of migrants. The flow of migrants, I give you an example when looking at the migration from Africa to Europe. And I mean, we do, you have, you have already alluded that. Why is migration high on the agenda? Because we have these irregular flows, particular, I mean, scenic across the, the Mediterranean where you have these wonderful pictures that journalists love and depending on which side you are politicians also, I mean, uh, exploit. So, that's the total flow of Africans coming to Europe. Blue, regular migration, people coming with residence permits and visa. Orange, asylum seekers. Now, the interesting thing outside the debate is that's in the spotlight. The number of asylum seekers was regular immigration to Europe from Africa is hardly ever discussed. Why is this the case? Because the data of people asking for asylum or having arrived yesterday is available uh, readily on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. So there's immediate reporting, whereas the number of uh, regular migrants from Africa is available with a delay of 12 to 18 months. I have worked in the cabinet of Mr. Juncker as migration policy advisor. I can tell you if I come with data that are 18 months old and say, oh, one and a half years ago, so many Africans have come, nobody's interested. Yeah. So the, the availability of the data, it's not just whether they're available, but when they're available also defines to a certain degree, the public discourse and the perception. And I think that's very important to, to filter in uh, when we are talking about that, that it, it not only depends what we know, but when we know it. So the majority of Africans coming to Europe comes in a legal and orderly manner. You have rarely ever heard that over the past seven, eight years since 2015. Almost never is that part discussed. So we know where these people are coming from. Um, half of it is not, um, so it, it has been decreasing and then increasing. Um, over the past uh, 10 years, 50% um, is from Northern Africa. And we also know why, I mean, under which title regular migration to Europe takes place. So rarely ever occupation. We are not recruiting labor from Northern or Sub-Saharan Africa. A little bit more, we see that this has increased over the past 15 years it's people getting scholarships, people allowed to study in the European University. But the vast majority of legal immigration from Africa is family reunion. And now comes the tricky part because one would like to know how is this happening? If we are not recruiting labor, how can it be that there's family reunion? Yeah, who are the people who can bring their families if we have not recruited the principal uh, anchor person who could renounce. And then if you think a little bit further, you see, okay, that's not family union, it's marriage migration. We are uniting families that have ne never existed before. And this has to do with the large diasporas we have from Moroccans and Algerians and Tunisians, <clears throat> like here in Brussels, for example. And then there's marriage between Morocco and the Moroccan diaspora of people living here. And I can show you this, uh, there's further data that could uh, support this, yeah? Now, we have data problems. One data problem is that different sources of information give you different information for the same year on the same flow that you would be interested. So that's three different sources, Eurostat, OECD, and United Nations, decomposed by our colleague Guy Abel, um, about immigration to Germany. Yeah, what, which one would you like to pick? Even larger the differences when it comes to emigration. I mean, we 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 know uh, for some countries we know nothing about emigration, but Germany 
uh, has fairly good statistics. But again, I mean, there's a huge gap. It makes a huge difference whether the emigration is 550,000 or close to a million, yeah, demographically, but also when it comes to the consequences, yeah, who these people are. So, um, and then there is data that exist and are considered to be reliable, but as they are never decomposed by the people using it, you don't see what kind of bullshit is in that data. So when you translate the stock data of the United Nations into flows, as Guy Abel and uh, our colleagues Azosa and Raftery have been doing, you can you, you, you convert this into a flow. And this is the example of huge flows of migrants between India and Pakistan uh, over the past 30 years. Now, we know that these flows have never existed. Yeah, So it depends on, I can show you the same between Morocco and Israel. There's huge flows between Morocco and Israel when you decompose the data. And this has to do with the fact that the stock data are changing. And this is then interpreted as a result of a recent flow. But um, it, 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 it depends in various ways how, how the data are readjusted in the past. So don't believe everything you see published uh, as official statistics. Uh, yeah, one has to uh, take a closer look. That's not easy. Yeah? Because the question is, how does a migration flow translate into a stock? And there's three determinants, three determinants. <clears throat> Obviously, the number of people arriving in a, on a more voluntary or forced basis. Yeah? So recent flows, flows feed into stocks. Um, then it's the size of return migration. This is a flow of international migrant that reduces a stock that's sometimes overlooked. Um, and then it's a duration of stay that inf influenced by the remaining life expectancy of migrants in destination countries. So that's a completely under-researched part. And most, most migration researchers overlook the fact that life expectancy is having an influence on the stock of migrants. It's totally unrelated to the flow of migrants. It has to do with the living conditions um, in the country of destination. Yeah, longevity matters. Whether you come at this age or at this age will have a huge impact um, on, the, on, the, on the stock uh, over time. Um, and longevity uh, at the place of destination plays a role. I got you the pictures of uh, uh, Henry Kissinger. If Henry Kissinger would have died 10 years ago, he would have reduced the number of into the stock of international migrants by one. Yeah. So it, this is completely outside our debates about stocks and flows, despite the fact it has a huge impact. Um, so we know more about immigration than about emigration, obviously. Um, and I give you an example uh, from a country that does well, uh, Austria, where, where I'm living currently, you have an inflow immigration, 145,000 people. Last year, it was even probably because of Ukraine and asylum seekers, maybe 300,000. So this is two, 3% of total population. It's uh, considerable. But usually, this is not discussed. That at the same time, 102,000 people have left Austria. Last year, probably more because most asylum seekers just moved on and didn't stay in Austria. So we, are, we, we have a larger focus on immigration than on emigration. Also, again, perception. Immigration data are a lot more discussed than emigration data. I mean, in most countries. Um, so, and then demographers break it down to net migration. So I have left out people because a net migrant does not exist. Yeah? Has no gender, has no age. Uh, has no place of origin and destination. It's just the netting. Now, unfortunately, many statistics and many forecasts are dealing with net migration. Um, I'll come to that. But it's important to look at immigration and emigration at the same time. You don't have to look uh, through the whole thing. I just wanted to give you the fact that you can decompose this by, by citizenship and, uh, and see that, uh, for example, Austria is the first uh, one uh, in the upper left and upper right. You see there's more Austrian citizens leaving than coming to the country, returning or whatever. There's almost no migration between Austria and Turkey, despite the fact that the, the, Austria has a huge uh, Turkish diaspora 
uh, based on, on the prior recruitment of labor uh, in the 1960s and 70s, which also means there's no marriage migration between Turkey and Austria, uh, and no family reunion, apparently, um, and so on. When, when you look at Afghanistan uh, and, and Syria, so huge inflows, almost no outflows. Yeah? Um, now comes the more interesting part of it. So that's a, two gross perspectives, gross inflows, gross outflows, and the net in the middle. But the even more interesting part is to see what happens to the inflow. How many years are people staying in a particular country? And for this, you, don't, you, you need to go beyond looking at immigration and emigration. You need a population register. And then you need to track people according to their individual number. And what you see here is something that I have recently tried to do with the Austrian uh, population register. You see the inflow in the year 2015, 16, and 19. And then you see after, depending on, in, in 2021, after six, five, um, and uh, two years, only half the people who have come are still in the country. And then something interesting. Um, so even it largely has to do with the, with the mobility of EU citizens coming in and going out. Uh, but what you see is, for example, with Afghans, the earlier they came, the more likely it is to have remained. And this is something you would not anticipate. Usually you would say, if they have come six years ago, the number of those who are still here should be smaller than those who have come two years ago. But what you see here is that the first wave of Afghans coming to Austria has remained there, and further waves of refugees have uh, uh, been moving on. Not so with Syrians. Hmm? Coming the same year, you still have 80% there. And then when you decompose for Afghans, you see it's the men who have left and it's the women who have stayed but there's many more men who have come than women. I, I just give you these details in order to understand how a flow translates into a stock and also integration issues are highly related to that. Most countries or most research is not taking this on board and into account. Um, <clears throat> and if we would have better data, we could also say what's the lifetime exposure to the likelihood of migration because today we say, oh, 3% of the population are immigrants uh, or emigrants or something like that. But one would like to know uh, how, during your lifetime, uh, how likely it is that you have lived in another country uh, than your country of birth. So how come that migration is not so well documented? I think for long statisticians and demographers were mainly looking at birth and death. Unlike birth and death, migration can be reversed immigration is of much greater interest and therefore better documented than emigration. And part of the migrant population has no interest in being statistically or administratively fully documented. And that's not just irregular migrants at the fringe. It also includes uh, retired people who are uh, retiring without deregistering. Uh, it's tax optimizers, as we all know, um, expats who don't see themselves as immigrants. Oh. Yeah, hedge fund managers, um, non-DOMs, uh, uh, people like that. So there is a large array. And now comes the most important thing. Main place of life, which is important for, I don't know, your social security number, uh, paying taxes or something like that, is becoming more and more a blurred concept because of lifestyle. Many people do not have a single place where they live. They live in two or three countries. I mean, the COVID uh, uh, um, the homework uh, situation, I think, has exposed that. And we, as researchers, do not have really yet the concepts and tools in dealing with mobile lifestyles that make you a resident and maybe even a, citizen, a dual citizen of, one, of more than one country. Yeah, I think that that's important. We, we, we do not yet have the analytical tools. We can do anthropological studies on that. But statistically, it's not documented. We don't have half persons uh, in our statistics, but this would be necessary. So final look at the future. When you look at this is German uh, statistics. Um, uh, they start is Bund. Um, you see when they project 
you have a basic variant without migration, and then you have a, 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 something with migration. And migration is given as a net migration here in the case of Germany being stable over time. No change till 2060, 300,000 a year. Now we have seen many years in Germany now recently where it was more than 300,000. No year where there was less. The question, where is it coming from? <clears throat> now our colleagues, Yasa, um, Vienna Wittgenstein Institute, uh, they have done this for, for JRC, uh, a, a big, big study here. So also no departure for net migration, they just say no migration, half the number status quo, um, uh, 259,000 a year, two times, four times, yeah? It offers you a wider array if you're a politician, is no help. Uh, but in order, yeah, no help. So to choose the future you want to prepare for. Uh, this is how we are talking to these people and then uh, ask ourselves, why are they not taking us more seriously? Yeah, that's one of the problem of discussion, but we're going to come to that tomorrow uh, before lunch. Uh, I'll give a few insights from my previous work. Um, so the question, how to model future migration? I give you three models here. The one is a gravity model for the United States, a, a linear model. Um, and this is the assumption of the United Nations. The United Nations projections assume that migration will go away within the next 120 years. Why? Because it's an aberration. The United Nations will bring e equal living conditions to everyone in the future. And if you have equal uh, living conditions, there's no need to migrate. Eurostat does the same. Despite the fact that we see a, an increasing population and labor market deficit, Eurostat assumes that migration will decrease in the future. Yeah, that's when, when you, it's not really published. You see a lot about uh, fertility assumption, mortality assumption, the, the migration assumption, because People are not exact, exactly proud of it, find themselves only in technical annexes. You really have to dig. Yeah. <clears throat> and this gives you this uh, interesting thing when you look at the United States, for example. Um, uh, so that's the Wittgenstein projection, uh, no migration to the, to the United States uh, uh, at the end of the century. Uh, this is the US Census Bureau, but not going beyond 2050, but they assume uh, as it is, and that's the United Nations uh, projection. Yeah. So I think we have no concept. Uh, we need to translate all these uh, scenarios that we are developing into something that can feed into a reasonable population projection. And for that, we would need to project migration. So Canada, Australia, the same. You don't have to. We need to get away from the concept of net migration. Our colleague Andre Rogers wrote an article of Requiem. Uh, for the net migrant uh, in 2050, uh, 1990, unfortunately, the concept is still around. Yeah, it's, a, it's not dying, uh, but quite alive. But I think the way forward is we need to analyze, model, and project immigration and emigration separately. Not only for the quantitative uh, effect it has, but also for, I mean, welfare, integration, whatever, whether people are just shuffled through uh, a society and an economy, or whether they are staying and become stable citizens has huge different implications. If we look at net or only at immigration and forget about the other side, um, it, it makes us less relevant. Huh? Let's put it that way. I know it's easy to say, I don't look uh, at places where it's difficult because I don't have enough data, uh, but that's like searching a key that you forgot, uh, you lost in front of your home, uh, you know, uh, somewhere where there is light instead of uh, putting more light in front of your home where you lost the key, as you know from this joke uh, that we all have heard. Okay, that's it from my side. I'm happy to, to be around yeah, with you and discuss. Thank you, Frank. Uh, and then uh, we have about eight minutes for actually, I can take care of it, uh, to get some of your questions. So please panelists, welcome to join on the front front seats here. And I give a microphone to Tuva. Thanks a lot. I think eight minutes will not ever be enough to get questions because we read so many things. But before I get the questions, I'd like to raise three points. Uh, to start with um, Anne's presentation, I think 
there is still a lot to talk about what we mean by managing migration because i think as a researchers we are talking about governing it however the old policy approach is usually towards how to manage it that's why we come with preventive approaches preparedness early warnings so i think those terminology only reflects the overall objective i think it's a huge difference between still the rhetoric between two areas and regarding the um wealth states i think it's really an undervalued and overlooked area because we hear a lot about all oh, a migrant abusing the welfare system or we are talking about rights but unequal access to rights when we consider citizens migrants and citizens with migrant background so i think it is still like it's going to be discussed further when we talk about this myth of cool factor i think uh, tom will also discuss tomorrow about that too and finally um Raina, yes the fam i mean the Asylum seekers are almost 10% overall. We have 33, over 33% of family migrants. However, family migrants is a black box too. It is the families of the diaspora, families of economic migrants, families of refugees, families of educational. So in fact, it is a combination where we really don't know much about. So I'm sure there are some questions an audience so please uh i think you got to talk to microphone for the online i will be very quick uh, for uh, Reiner's presentation that uh, so i'm responsible for wittgenstein projections and uh, i can assure you that from the beginning we have been always considering the flows so we always do the flows inflows and outflows of the migrants but then when we present it uh, I think people want to hear about net migration. That's how we put them together. Otherwise, it's always we do the bi regional model for each country. We, we look at how many people are going out and how many people are coming in. So, what we don't do is like where they are coming from is not included because it would be too much. Uh, but we are going into that direction. But you had a good point, but uh, from our side, we are good at that. <laughs> Much Conrad Penjivia from Krakow University of Economics. Uh, I found Reiner's uh, presentation particularly thought provoking. And just a quick comment on uh, the Gulf uh, countries uh, and the, the, the opinion that, uh, that there are no uh, migration sort of research on this area. I partly agree with you. I think I, I, I know a few researchers working on, on this area, but also uh, there is a clear reason for that, uh, namely, there is no political will and interest in these countries and the possibility to carry out research in these countries. So basically, I've been working in this area uh, on issues of migration, and it's super tough uh, in some countries to get access to any sort of data and field sometimes. Uh, so these are the, uh, some of the reasons. Yeah. So um, it is a little bit of a question to you all because I mean the I think the common base that I saw in all is who is the migrant? Because we've been talking about migrants, immigrants, immigrants, citizens, foreign bones, and also when you stop being a migrant, because most of the talks are based on not only the newcomers or the new arrivals and resident permits, we are also gathering the long-term residents, we are still considering the diaspora, we have the fourth generation in Europe, we still call them migrants. So when one stops being migrant in that sense. Um, could I show the, the link that I just sent uh, via the, thank you. I, I just wanted to say a few words, thanks for that. And um, thanks to the other speakers who gave very clear presentations and I found very interesting. I think the gaps in political will and the resources to address the gaps in the data is a big issue. And I think one of the the um, the gaps that in in public knowledge about uh, the difference between stocks and flows is the people who are missing in the data. 
so who are documented in the missing migrants project which uh, looks at how many people have gone missing during migration journeys and and collects evidence wherever possible but is a very much an undercount of how, how many people are missing and um, so this concept of choosing the future you want to prepare for i think we should be saying the, the gaps in the data around deaths and missing migrants should indicate to policymakers that it's not enough to keep reproducing this narrative of drivers of managed migration that we need to look at the policies that produce harm at the border and take account of the responsibility of states to not reproduce harmful policies and if we as academics don't address this then we're reproducing a narrative which is a, a not addressing that gap in the policies so the the gaps in the data tell us where there are gaps in policy and i think we have a responsibility to address that so it's political will is resources but it's also about how we're going to show some intellectual academic leadership and, and policy leadership to show what needs to be done as well Uh, a quick word, maybe uh, connecting also to one point you made earlier about the question of inequality, which I think is a is a, is a um, is a, a core concern for for many migration researchers. And so I know there will also be the topic of our upcoming uh, Ibisco annual conference in Warsaw, uh, where I hope to see many of you. Um, yeah, on, I think for for us, um, the one of the I think we've we've uh, discovered when working on migration welfare was also uh, this idea that uh, inequalities uh, in, access, in in dealing with welfare still continues even after the second generation, third generation. So it's not only about just being an immigrant and having to face a number of conditions to access benefits, but it's also how these inequalities can perpetuate. And I think Reiner took the, mentioned the case of family reunification earlier, which I think is a very good example of that because the right to live uh, in family is very different for natives with or without immigrant roots. So if, you're, if you wish to, to indeed bring over your, your family, your conditions, your ability to access welfare will be significantly restrained because you know that if you use welfare, you will most likely be unable to bring over a, a, your, your relative. So that's, that's one element. And another element that feeds into this discussion about inequality, I think, is from the standing state perspective that there, is, there are very strong differences uh, between state, between welfare states and how, to, how they deal with the welfare of their citizens abroad. And it's, it's quite striking to see how the famous examples, for example, such as Mexico, goes as far as creating you know, a special access to, to social security with guaranteed access to, 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 to healthcare for its citizens whenever they travel back to Mexico, to others, of course, who completely deny. And the same applies within Europe with some uh, countries very being very proactive with assistance abroad. We're very struck by the case of France that really allows uh, citizens to remain uh, remain a part of their social security systems abroad, and others who really don't allow such things. So there is a lot of uh, things to still be discussing about uh, inequalities of access to to welfare systems for immigrants, but also for descendants. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <clears throat> Thanks for the your also small remark. When happy to discuss it, we have published a paper on that. that I'm happy to share with you. Uh, uh, concerning the Gulf, I didn't want to blame anyone. I just wanted to say, as we were looking for blind spots, I wanted to say Europe gives you a much larger possibility to to have data, not only statistically, uh, I mean from statistical offices, but to, to have studies uh, that go deeper or at micro level. Uh, we don't have that. I mean, in, as I said, in the Gulf states, it's journalistic evidence. Uh, and in, in Western Africa, rarely ever uh, anyone is looking into it. There's uh, uh, no genuine migration research in these countries uh, of researchers born there or residing there at the university, despite the fact there's a lot of universities, both in Western Africa, but also in the Gulf states. Yeah. But it's uh, under research. <clears throat> Family reunion. I mean, this really is to do with you. Family is the most important legal gate of entry to the EU overall. Yeah, we have 2 million people coming to the EU, 27 every year for more than 12 months. And 
uh, the largest uh, proportion is family uh, reunion. But often from countries where there's no recruitment of labor, and so family union, reunion can only be marriage migration. Yeah, so we are uniting families that have not ne never existed before. And then comes the tricky integration question from a basic human rights point of view, that's acceptable, right to family life. From an integration point of view, it's all bad because you are bringing constantly people from non-integrated newcomers joining already integrated, more or less integrated citizens uh, with diaspora origins in Europe, often with the purpose of having children instead of uh, starting to work. You see that the, the take up rate of work of in particular women who are coming as brides is uh, fairly low. Yeah, And so then the question is, is this a sign of disintegration that the Belgium, or the, the Moroccan diaspora in Belgium has to look for uh, brides and grooms uh, in the Rif Atlas? Uh, why can't they, I mean, it's a question that we have not researched. It's, it's a bit of a taboo around it also. Yeah? And I'm, I'm, I'm totally with you, it's a black box, but there's all this idea, let's not touch, let's not uh, discuss it. It's an ethics question that we'll raise tomorrow. Maybe if we put too much limelight on it and we'll have a negative debate about it, so better we don't know it and no one else will know it, something like that. I think there's a little bit of that. There's no Horizon 2020 project on marriage migration um, and, and its consequences or on family reunion. Yeah. A lot more on labor migration and particularly on asylum seekers and, and, and refugees. Uh, also, you see the political priority uh, that I wanted to say. Here, no, the, the, the picture that Anne has just shown um, uh, is, is uh, uh, you say, horrifying in the sense, but it's also a good example of a misleading picture um, because it shows you the number of people who have died in the Mediterranean, it shows you the number of people who have died, uh, I don't know, in the Caribbean, it shows you the like that. people that are known about. It's, it doesn't show you how many. Exactly. It totally omits the fact that many more people dying when crossing the Sahara than in the Mediterranean. But there's no NGOs. NGOs are not active in, in again, for the reason it's more difficult. Uh, so there's no rescue. Uh, and the countries uh, where people are dying in Mali or in Chad or, or wherever are not interested in, in, in these people. Often uh, they die outside say, civilization. So you see, it, it, it's a kind of, it puts the, it puts the, it puts more emphasis on the Mediterranean than on the Sahara because of, again, it's because of the blind, it's a good example of a blind spot that can lead to the wrong conclusions that more needs to be done about the Mediterranean. No, more needs to be done about the Sahara. More needs to be done about the policies. <laughs> um, that's, <laughs> the question is where, yeah? if you want to rescue you. people, and you have scarce resources, the question is where is it the most efficient? Yeah. So from a rescue point of view, if you're an NGO. Yeah? And uh, NGOs are operating the same way. There's more people dying. Uh, it's more dangerous to cross from Mauritania, Senegal, and southern Morocco into the Canary Islands than going from Tunisia to Lampedusa. Mm -hmm. But there is no uh, SOS Mediterranean. There's no uh, NGO ship, for example, operating uh, in this part of the Atlantic between uh, the western coast of Africa and, and, and the Canary Island, uh, because also they have other priorities. Uh, I just wanted to say how the data that we are producing are influencing perception and decision. That's all I wanted to say. Yeah. And I think that's a good example uh, for that. I mean, when looking we have two more questions yeah. in the order, but uh, there are several points that I do agree, but I'm going to leave it for the coffee discussion, but I want to give forward to Anne to reflect on that. Thanks. Just to reflect on what Ryan has said, I, I don't agree with him at all. And this is a very good example of how we'll get lots of constructive discussion next two days. Um, I think that well, I was given, given that example of where there are gaps in data show where there are gaps in policy. The policies I'm talking about are the policies that actually reproduce harm at the borders. And it includes deaths on land. It includes the fact that there are no safe legal routes. But to give a positive example as well, you're talking about mobility in West Africa. I worked on these guidelines with um, Dennis Kierens for IOM on the guidelines for the harmonization of migration data man management in the ECOWAS region. 
And these guidelines are being implemented across West Africa, and they're being taken up around the rest of the other RECs, the regional economic um, communities in Africa. And so there are some efforts to improve the data collection so that it's from a, a different base, but the work is, is ongoing around that. Thanks. So uh, we have we're really eating out our coffee time. There is one question. Let me take this one, and I mean yours will be the last. Matthias, let's ask. Uh, given the importance of re-immigration, re-emigration, and duration of stay, how should we assess the demographic impact of immigration? Conventional demographic methods are not suitable for that. Anyone would like to reply to that? Like re-emigration. Yeah. Yeah. I'm the, the, the data that I've shown you on Austria about the Afghans and the Syrians comparing, I think that's the only valid demographic approach that you look individually at cohorts of immigrants and see how long they are either staying or, I mean, that's a joint uh, issue between you and me, until they die. Yeah, so there's two ways, there's two ways of not being an immigrant anymore in the statistical sense. And that's an answer to your earlier question. Either you die or you return to your country of origin. Yeah, statistically, you stay a migrant for all your life, like Henry Kissinger or Arnold Schwarzenegger or Anne Hidalgo, yeah, the mayor of Paris. She statistically is a migrant because she's not born in France. But in the common sense perception, uh, we don't think about these people as uh, migrants. And this is why it's so important to look at this stock and flow interplay. The stock includes Anne Hidalgo and uh, Henry Kissinger and Arnold Schwarzenegger. The perception that we need to do something about migration, the integration, I mean, it's totally irrelevant. These are cases of well-integrated people. It's a success story, but there's no reason to, I mean, worry about that. Yeah, and I think that's, uh, we, we, we would need better data and we would need to analyze them at individual level out of population registers. But unfortunately, the majority of country doesn't have that. And so there, then we have to think about workarounds. But the interesting question is when you have a cohort of people coming into a country in a particular year, and then they can separate refugees, family migrants, uh, educational migrants, uh, labor migrants, and then you see what happens to that cohort, ideally. Yeah? How long are they staying? When how long are they employed? What they are earning? Some questions like that. Or what's the welfare position of these people if you have data? Yeah, how, mu how much are they getting out of the system? Things like that. This would be ideally the, the demographic approach that we would need and that would translate into practical answers uh, to politicians um, that they might be looking for. As long as we don't have that and flood them with stock data, it's of no help. Yeah, okay. Uh, hi, super briefly, I'm Damien from IOM and coming back from five years of data collection uh, role in Dakar. Um, I think it's quite important to also, yes, indeed start focusing on, on other regions and on drivers in those regions. Um, and a plea to you, we have a decent amount of data in, the, in this region, particularly in Western Central Africa. And with the right data sharing agreement, we're quite happy to, to, to share those and to enable your research. So please talk to us. <laughs> so thanks a lot. We need to wrap up if you want to have some coffee and some oxygen. So we will be back in 10 minutes or oh, yeah. So it will be good. So we can, we still have a lot to discuss. So it will be a very fruitful day. Thanks a lot.